Today we will be looking at a case from the early 1900s. So sit back as we go to the USA. George Bailey was born in the small town of Whitefield in Lincoln County in Maine. When he finished his schooling, he started to work. And when still just a young man, married a lady from Lynn in Massachusetts. They lived together in the town of Alna in Maine, where George's wife gave birth to two children before tragedy struck and the poor young lady died. In the wake of his wife's passing, George found himself engulfed in an overwhelming tide of grief. Left with two young children, he faced the challenges of single parenthood, dealing with the new reality of raising them alone. Unable to do this, he married again, this time to a young woman named Miss Abby Hilton, who came from the nearby town of Wiscasset. Here, George began to work as a blacksmith, and over the next few years, Abby gave birth to four children. The marriage, however, faced many troubles, and in the spring of 1897, George abandoned his family as he started a relationship with Miss Susie Young, his wife's half-sister. This abrupt departure left Mrs. Abby Bailey in a difficult predicament. Seemingly deserted by her husband, she was now tasked with providing for herself and six children. To ensure their well-being amidst the upheaval, she made the heart-wrenching decision to place them with families in Whitefield and Wiscasset. Despite the adversity, she eventually secured employment as a housekeeper. Anxious to move away from the town, and the complications associated with leaving his wife. In the company of Miss Young, George went to live in Saugus, at the residence of a gentleman named Mr. Henry O. Mitchell. However, in October of 1897, the opportunity arose for him to take the lease on Breakheart Hill Farm, an 18-acre property nestled within the vast Breakheart Hill Forest. This had been made possible through the Forestry Association based in Lynn, on the condition that he agreed to take on the responsibility of overseeing the hunting camps within the forest, which would earn him a modest but welcome income of 20 cents per hour. Over the next two years, things seemed to be going quite well for Mr George Bailey and Miss Susie Young. In the year 1899, a man named Mr John Courtney Best was employed to assist on the farm. Mr Best was born on the 8th of April 1865 in the town of Sackville, in New Brunswick. Growing up as one of nine children, his early years were a blend of structured schooling until the age of 12 and hands-on farm labour that installed a robust work ethic. During these years, his exceptional talent as a marksman set him apart and earned him much recognition in the community. Following his education, he worked for 10 years on a farm that was owned by Mr Alfred Ayres, who was a very good friend of his father. However, farm labour did not pay very well, and in an attempt to earn more money, he started to explore alternative employment opportunities. Over the next few years, he worked in a shoe factory, a grocery store, and a local Sackville hotel. The turning point in John Best's life unfolded in 1891, when his sister, Mrs Nettie Stiles, made a journey back to her hometown of Sackville, from the home she shared with her husband in Lynn, she told her brother about the factories and industry in the town and suggested that John join her on the return trip. He agreed and once in Lynn, decided to stay. He soon found employment at J.B. Renton, a heel manufacturer, and it seemed that everything was going well for him. However, the year 1898 brought unforeseen challenges as John faced assault charges, resulting in a four-month sentence which he served at the Salem House of Correction. Undeterred, upon his release, he returned to Lynn, finding employment at a different heel manufacturer. Eventually, however, he returned to work at J.B. Renton, until the factory workers went on strike in 1899. At the end of the 19th century, and the start of the 20th century, labour unions in the United States of America were on the rise. They addressed such things as lengthy work hours and inadequate pay. However, at the time, the legal environment was not particularly favourable to the unions. Court decisions often reflected a tendency to side with the employers, limiting the ability of workers to organise a strike. Additionally, 
anti-union sentiments among some segments of the public and policy makers further complicated the effort of the unions. However, the workers at JB Renton's did strike, which left employees relying on the little amount of strike pay they received. And like many of the people who worked there, John Courtney Best faced financial hardship as he was now left without an adequate income. This is why during the strike, he managed to secure employment at the modest Breakheart Hill Farm, owned by Mr George Bailey. His tenure at the farm spanned a month until the strike concluded, prompting his return to J.B. Renton's. By May 1900, disenchanted with the industrial setting, he wholeheartedly embraced full-time farm work with Mr Bailey. The two men agreed that Mr Best would do half the cultivating on the farm in exchange for a room to sleep and half the profits from the crops. Amidst the picturesque landscape of Breakheart Hill, a complex relationship started to unfold between George Bailey, Susie Young and John Best. On the surface, the trio projected an image of unity working side by side, yet beneath the facade of tranquility simmered some unspoken tensions. Mr Best expressed misgivings about Mr Bailey's treatment of the farm animals and questioned the transparency of his financial dealings. Mr Bailey in turn levelled accusations at Mr Best, citing perceived laziness and an apparent struggle with alcohol. The intricacies of these dynamics were revealed through Mr Bailey's strategic management of Mr Best's finances. Pay was not promptly issued, but rather tactically delayed until after the sale of crops, a move calculated to prevent Mr Best's earnings from being squandered at the local saloon. George Bailey carefully allocated limited funds for farm equipment, recognising Mr Best's propensity to dissipate money on less productive pursuits. The situation was far from good. It was one of unresolved grievances, financial issues and the disagreements that harmed their interactions. It was also detrimental to the prosperity of the farm. On the 27th of September 1900, Miss Young left Breakheart Hill to attend her sick mother in Wiscasset. George Bailey chose not to join her. His reluctance, rooted in the circumstances of his previous hasty departure from the town. Instead, she went alone, accompanied by her young son. Consequently, George Bailey and John Best found themselves trying to work together without the calming influence of Miss Young. Everything seemed to be peaceful until Monday the 8th of October. That night brought unexpected disturbances. Between 9.30 and 9.40 p.m., two distinct gunshots pierced the air. At approximately 10 p.m., Hannah Hawkes, an elderly resident who lived on the road that led to the farm, heard the hurried departure of a carriage coming in the direction of her house from the farm. Later that night, she was stirred from her sleep by the return of the carriage, echoing a mysterious journey under the cover of darkness. Further afield in Lynn, Mrs Aura Bede, who resided near Floating Bridge Pond, encountered an unusual episode at around 1.30am. The rhythmic rattle of a wagon drew her attention, and as she got up, she observed it passing her home. The distinct sound of horse hooves on the bridge planks accompanied the wagon until it reached the midpoint. After a five minute silence, she heard the horse being driven back over the bridge, followed by the return of the wagon past her house. The peculiar noise it made when passing suggested that it may have had a loose wheel. The following day, Tuesday the 9th of October, Mr Bailey was nowhere to be seen. Seemingly worried about his whereabouts, Mr Best went to the homes of his neighbours, Sarah Rowe, Simon McKenna and Annie Dwyer to ask if they had seen him. A sense of unease accompanied his inquiries. His words carrying the weight of concern, he told them that Mr Bailey had not been seen since 8 o'clock the previous evening. Meanwhile, Mr James W Thomas had noticed a bonfire in the yard at Breakheart Hill Farm. Although not unheard of, it was quite unusual for a fire to be so close to the house. He went to investigate, and as the flames flickered, he noticed what appeared to be the fragment of a horse blanket hidden in the embers. 
adding to the unfolding mystery were the keen observations of Johnny Mitchell and Wynne Rowe, the farm's young assistants. They had already noted that two horse blankets were missing, which was very strange as they were always kept in the same place. Though no official report was filed, news of Mr George Bailey's disappearance soon spread throughout the area. Mr Clough, a co-owner of the property, caught wind of these rumours. Speculation swirled, with some claiming that Mr Best, now left alone at the farm, was neglecting the livestock due to frequent intoxication. Fueled by a mix of curiosity and concern, Mr Clough visited the property and engaged in a direct conversation with Mr Best. In a candid exchange, Mr Best put forth the notion that Mr Bailey had fled, alleging a looming arrest for abandoning his wife and six children. On the 17th of October, the stillness of Floating Bridge Pond was shattered by a macabre discovery, a man's torso concealed within a bag. Two bullet holes had pierced the body. Suspicion lingered in the air, a whisper that this gruesome find might be Mr George Bailey. The police went straight to Breakheart Hill Farm to speak with Mr John Best. They asked him to return with them to the station and gave him the haunting task of trying to identify the body. Yet before undertaking this sombre duty, he produced a partially filled pint of whiskey and swiftly consumed its contents, perhaps a frantic indulgence in drink, in order to help confront his approaching sadness. With trepidation, Mr Best confirmed that the clothing draped over the unfortunate corpse had belonged to Mr George Bailey. The day unfolded further when the legs of the ill-fated man were found. Saugus Police Chief Charles Thompson later confirmed Mr Best's identification and with eerie precision matched the corpse's height, hair colour and shoe size to that of the missing Mr Bailey. The ominous saga deepened as a shoemaker named Mr Darius W Brewer lent his expertise to the grim discovery, attesting that the shoes belonged without doubt to Mr George Bailey, adding a poignant touch, a small watch bag that had been meticulously crafted by Miss Young was discovered on the body. As the bags that had covered Mr Bailey's remains were unveiled, a chilling revelation emerged. They bore the distinct imprint of the company I.H. Eston Sons, with the words hay and grain written upon them. This was a very supplier, constantly favoured by George Bailey. Upon investigation at the farm, the police encountered a series of hauntingly identical bags, casting a sinister shadow over the landscape and deepening the mystery surrounding Mr George Bailey's tragic demise. George Neal from Massachusetts State Police spearheaded the investigation with the assistance of officers from Lynn and Sargas. Following the identification of the body, police sought permission from Mr Best to search the house, a request to which he agreed and provided them with lanterns for the task. In the course of the search, a profound discovery unfolded. One of the two bullets retrieved from the body matched the barrel of a rifle unearthed at the farmhouse. Analysis of the firearm suggested that there had been a recent discharge. However, Mr Best insisted that the gun had accidentally gone off approximately one week prior. A more meticulous examination of the house brought to light unsettling details, including bloodstains on the carpet, wallpaper and the windowsill of Mr Best's bedroom. When questioned about these ominous marks, Mr Best assured the officers that they had been present since he had moved in. In light of these findings, Mr John Best was arrested on suspicion of murder. The following day added another layer to the enigma as the police noticed the deliberate removal of several stones from the wall Remarkably, these stones mirrored both the colour and geological composition of those that had been placed in the bags used to weigh down Mr Bailey's body. On the 18th of October, Dr Pinkman determined the murder date as the 8th of October. He made this assumption based on the deceased man's stomach contents. Bullet trajectory suggested a seated Mr Bailey was shot at a 45 degree angle. Dr Pinkman added, that internal bleeding 
might explain why no blood was found at the site of the shooting. However, he went on to say that the area where the limbs were severed would have been covered in blood. So with this information, the police decided to focus on finding this location. A cartridge found under a barn window supported the theory that Mr Bailey was shot while seated in his wagon. Later, however, after discovering Mr Bailey's overcoat in his bedroom, the police shifted the theory and decided that the shooting took place in the kitchen. Later, the theory changed again when it was proposed that Mr Bailey was shot climbing the barn cellar stairs. Miss Young returned from Maine on the 22nd of October, her grief very evident. She spoke to detectives. She pointed out the bloodstains on the floor and the walls of the storeroom and said that they were not present when she departed. She told the officers that it seemed as though someone had recently cleaned the floor. When the police looked at the area, they suspected that it must have been where Mr Bailey's body was dismembered. The trial of Mr John Courtney Best commenced on the 18th of March 1901 and an air of anticipation filled the courtroom with the press and the public captivated by the proceedings. However, it was not until the fifth day of this riveting legal spectacle that the narrative took a compelling turn. Mr William H. Stiles, the brother-in-law of the accused, stepped into the witness box, revealing a conversation he had had with the defendants. He said that Mr Best had disclosed the existence of hidden property, including a watch stowed away in the barn's basement. He added that his brother-in-law had asked him to fling it away as far as he could at the low water mark. Mr Stiles went on to say that Mr Best did not say to who the watch had belonged, but had mentioned that if it was found, it would lead to his downfall. After this surprising revelation, law enforcement promptly proceeded to Breakheart Hill Farm. After a search, they found there, hidden among the rafters, a parcel meticulously wrapped in newspaper, which contained a valuable gold watch, $75 in cash, a pocket knife, and a fragment of a leather coat, reminiscent of Mr Bailey's attire on the day of his demise. A gentleman named Mr Oakes M. Palmer, who was a reputable watchmaker from Pittston in Kennebec County in Maine, provided testimony indicating that the serial number on the watch matched that of a timepiece that Mr Bailey had entrusted him to repair twice in 1891. In response to inquiries about the watch, Mr Best told the court that he only acquired it after Mr Bailey had disappeared. He insisted that the deceased man had owed him money and he viewed this as the only way of recovering the debt. The trial reached its conclusion on the 28th of March. The press and the public eagerly awaited the jury's verdict. After six hours of anticipation, the jury returned to declare the defendant, Mr John Courtney Best, guilty of the murder of Mr George Bailey, and the judge sentenced him to death. There were the usual appeals, but they were all rejected. On the 28th of August 1902, Mr John Courtney Best was transferred from Salem Jail to Charlestown State Prison. His execution took place there on the 9th of September, during which time he maintained his composure and refrained from uttering any final words. A letter he had written to his parents shortly before his execution was revealed to the public on September the 20th. In the letter, he detailed the state of his personal matters and once again asserted his innocence. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case.